Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the uh, meeting of the City Council of Thousand Oaks for the night of October 13th, 2009. Uh, would you please stand and join me in pledging allegiance to our flag? Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, the clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Fox. Here. Councilmember De La Pena, absent at this time. Councilmember Irwin. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Gillette. Here. Mayor Glancy. Here. Okay, item four, request for continuance of uh, any public hearing or agenda item. I'll note that agenda item 11A, Senior Adult Master Plan, will be presented before 9A, a department report. Um, at this time, it's uh, time for our special presentation, so give me a moment to get down to the, to the dais. Thank you. Well, now, uh, for our first presentation, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to representatives from one of our city's longtime community partners, the Canadian Recreation and Park District. I'd like to introduce Susan Holt, board chair, to tell us about a recent milestone reached by our Alex Fiore Thousand Oaks Teen Center. Susan? Thank you, Good. Thank you. Please, you got it. Sure. Thank you very much. Well, the Alex Fiore Thousand Oaks Teen Center opened in October 1989, and it's been a fast 20 years. <laughs> and it was a joint project between Caneo Recreation and Park District and the City of Thousand Oaks. I have with me tonight, over here, we have uh, Dr. Liz Benton, who is the Administrator for Recreation and Community Services. And we have Karen Lindsay, who is our Recreation Services Manager. And Brenda Coleman, who is the Teen Services Director. And uh, all of them have been very instrumental in keeping the Teen Center the fabulous uh, facility that it is. The commitment of the city and the Caneo Recreation and Park District uh, to provide staff and programming and also maintaining the facility has resulted in an outstanding asset for this community. The Teen Center serves literally thousands of students each year. Programs include all kinds of things, including some large-scale special events, such as middle school and high school dances, talent shows, and much more. Then there are programs such as the surf camp, website design, and hip-hop, <laughs> among others, that provide outstanding social development skills for the teens. There are volunteer opportunities, too, and leadership growth opportunities in terms of, say, the Teen Leadership Council and the Advisory Committee. There are dropping uh, activities also that are ongoing opportunities for the teens to uh, mingle with their peers and participate in unstructured activities such as those in the gym or the game room or the computer room. So anyway, it is uh, the thousand. We're very proud of the Thousand Oaks Teen Center because it is a very safe haven for the teens in our community. It's a place they can and do call their own. I'm going to invite all of you to the 20th anniversary, which will include tours of the facility, refreshments, class demonstration, and a formal recognition of this great milestone. The celebration takes place this Thursday, October 15th, 5 to 7, at the Alex Fiore Thousand Oaks Teen Center. So we'll see you there. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Susan, I have a commendation here in honor of the Alex Fiore Thousand Oaks Teen Center I'd like to read okay. because it is a tremendous accomplishment. I have to tell you that I am so pleased when I drive by there and I see all the cars lined up with the young people going in to take advantage of the facility. It's, it's definitely been a tremendous addition to our community. Yeah. So, thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> commendation in honor of Alex Fiore Thousand Oaks Teen Center 20th anniversary. 
Whereas the Alex Fiore Teen Center is celebrating 20 years of service to the city of Thousand Oaks Youth, and whereas the Alex Fiore Teen Center has served several million community youth during its 20-year history, influencing self-esteem, social interaction, and life development skills for participating teen grades 7 through 12. And whereas the Alex Fiore Teen Center provides numerous services, such as the soundproof music room, as well as valuable programs in form of youth outreach program, college entry testing classes, self-improvement workshops, driver education, excursions, computer science programs, art, music, dance training, sports opportunities which benefit the teens of Thousand Oaks, and whereas the momentum for, thousand, for the Alex Fiore Teen Center was initiated by Mayor Emeritus Alex T. Fiore, a 30-year city councilman, who created a committee of local youth to meet and discuss the needs of our community teens. And whereas the Alex Fiore Teen Center's outstanding achievements are the result of this dedicated management of Canaria Recreation Park District officials and staff. Now, therefore, I, Thomas P. Glancy, Mayor of the City of Thousand Oaks, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby congratulate and commend Alex Fiore Thousand Oaks Teen Center on their 20th anniversary and express our appreciation for their service to our community teens. We extend our best wishes for continued success in the future. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you hit some of the ones I missed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, you mean Thursday? Yeah, Thursday. Okay. Okay, super, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, ah, <laughs> that's the important part. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Carol Nussbaum up here. Carol, it's always a pleasure uh, having you here. It's a pleasure you're being with the city because I have to tell you, our residents have the advantage now of going to really very high quality productions and it's only minutes for, from their homes. So you've done, a, as I say every time you come in here, you've done just such a bang up job. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. I'll let you have this Thanks opportunity so to. Uh, Thank you. Well, certainly We're lucky it. we have all this talent. <laughs> we certainly do. And if you'll introduce your performers, I certainly will. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor and esteemed council members, invaluable city staff, and everybody from Thousand Oaks. I wanted to take a moment just to mention to you two awards Cabrillo has received since I last saw you this summer. And Cabrillo was honored by the U.S. Commerce Association with the 2009 Business of the Year Award for Westlake Village. We also, last week, I had the privilege of personally receiving an award from our esteemed State Senator Tony, Tony Strickland, honoring all the work and success we've achieved with Cabrillo. And I want to thank our City Council and actually all our TO residents for the great support they've given us through the years. So we're getting ready to open, and we're going to open on Friday. This Friday, we're going to run through October 25th, straight from Broadway to Broadway in your backyard, Guys and Dolls, that nine-time Tony Award winner. And it is a Cabrillo show if there ever was one. Big cast, big sets, big costumes, 32 cast members, 53 staff. And we start out at the helm with Sky Masterson, you may recall the Marlon Brando role and we have the heartthrob from Days of Our Lives Jeff Griggs starring in it we also have in the Frank Sinatra role Barry Pearl he's from the movie Grease he just finished his national tour on Happy Days and he recently appeared in the TV show House Miss Adelaide is being played by Alec Taylor she was on the national tour of the producers and of course who could forget Jessica Bernard one of our stars in Cats, she'll be Sarah Brown. To purchase tickets, you can go to our lovely box office, call 805-449-ARTS. You can click to Ticketmaster, or you can call them at 800-745-3000. So now it's time to hold on to your seats, because Nova Sappho, our Nicely Nicely, is going to get us all rocking the boat. Well, it came to me kind of funny, like a dream. That's it, a dream. I dreamed last night I got on a boat to heaven, and by some chance I had brought my dice along. And there I stood, and I hollered someone, thank me. 
But the passengers, they know right from wrong. For the people said, sit down, sit down, you rock in the boat. People said, sit down, sit down, you rock in the boat. And you never will drag you under by the sharp lapels of your checkered coat. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you rock in the boat. I sailed away on that little boat to heaven And by some chance found a bottle in my fist And there I stood nicely passing out the whiskey But the passengers were bound to resist For the people said beware, you're on a heavenly trip People all said beware, beware, you scuttle the ship Drag you under by the fancy tie around your wicked throat. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you rock the boat. And as I laughed at those passengers to heaven, <laughs> a great big wave came and washed me overboard. And then I sang and I hollered, someone save me. That's the moment I woke up. Thank the Lord. And I said to myself, sit down, sit down, you rock the boat. I said to myself, sit down, sit down, you rock the boat. And the devil will drag you under with the soul so heavy you'd never blow. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you rock the boat. Talented citizenry. Thank you so very much. Uh, the city manager and I were just con uh, consulting as to whether or not the uh, crew should fill out speaker cards. <laughs> Carol, thank you very much for bringing uh, another what will be a great hit. Thank you. I didn't know the city staff sang so well. <laughs> <laughs> just one of many talents. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, would the clerk please call uh, public comments? This is a time and place for public comments. The speaker card is available for those wishing to address the city council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction. All speakers for public hearings shall be called and heard during the public hearing. Pursuant to council standards of operation, the mayor may assist any speaker from straying into areas not within the city's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole. Under state law, issues discussed under public comments can have no action unless listed on the agenda and may be referred to the city manager for administrative action or scheduled on a subsequent agenda. All documents for city council and the official city record should be presented to the city clerk prior to speaking. Speakers are requested to state name and city of residence for the record. Six people have presented cards and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. Thank you very much. Our first speaker will be Chuck Cronin, followed by Gaston Monast, followed by Dr. Richard Elsley. I would ask subsequent speakers uh, to position themselves close to the uh, dais, if you would. Good evening. Thank you. To the City Council, appreciate this opportunity. This is just a brief update on the uh, the stop team. At you know, if I may, uh, please state your uh, your name and city of residence. Okay, Thank Charles you. Cronin, Chuck Cronin, Thousand Oaks, 1912 Maya Perdera. Uh, the residents of Thousand Oaks ask that you continue to support the protest to the Presidential Substation Project. The more the time has passed, the more we've come to find out that the project is only not needed, but there are new programs coming down from Southern California Edison that mitigate the need. 
In uh, December 2008, when we first received the proposal, the city council was very proactive and protested, uh, passed a resolution to protest the project. At that time, Southern California Edison indicated a 25% increase in demand over the next 10 years. The California Energy Commission indicated that there would only be a, a usage growth of 6% in this area. Population growth in Simi Valley and Thousand Oaks is less than 2% over the same period. Since then, Southern California has been requested but has refused to provide a detailed explanation of their inflated demand of 25 percent. And further information indicated that as late as last month, Southern California Edison indicated that the, Se that the presidential substation project was exclusively for the need of Simi Valley and not for Thousand Oaks because we asked them to combine that project with that of Newbury Park. Since 2008, Several new programs have been approved for Southern California Edison that will impact the, the peak demand in our area. One being the 2009 CPUC loading order. Not to get technical, it basically says from now on Southern California Edison has to attempt conservation before transmission and before generation of power. Smart Connect is a man was one of those conservation programs. It's a mandatory program for Thousand Oaks costing $1.63 billion. Our share of that is around $30 million. Smart Connect, according to independent parties, will reduce the peak demand by anywhere from 17 to 23 percent. There are other programs that are in the statement that I've provided you. We're asking that you continue to protest the project, that you ask uh, Southern California Edison to give us priority for implementation of the mandatory conservation program, Smart Connect. We're going to pay for it. We may as well get the benefit for it. It's to be implemented before the presidential substation. And that you uh, uh, again request Southern California Edison to provide a detailed uh, a model for which it projects of 25 percent. That's up. It supports its 25 percent increase in demand. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Next speaker, Gaston Monast, followed by Dr. Richard Elsley, followed by Kathy Rudnicki. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, member of the City Council. Uh, my presentation may be redundant from Mr. Cronin, but I just wanted to uh, let you know that I live at 5006 Reed Road in Thousand Oaks, and I'm here to protest the uh, substation, the presidential substation. Um, we've always been told... Pardon me, sir. Would you mind getting a little closer to the mic? Sorry. Uh, we've been told that the uh, substation was for uh, serving Thousand Oaks, but uh, during the CPUC public hearing at the Ventura County Government Center on September 18th, uh, Mr. Byrne, who is the Director of uh, Regulatory Operation for Southern California Edison, mentioned that the presidential substation is strictly for Simi Valley. If you look at the minutes on the meeting uh, from the CPUC on page 8 and 9, from line uh, 23 on page 8 to, page, to line 19 of page 9, Mr. Byrne admits that this station is strictly for Simi Valley. And Simi Valley, I guess, felt the need to push the station and the transmission line into Thousand Oaks, even though it's for their own use and it should have been sent somewhere else. Now, we have suggested many times that the uh, substation be moved to uh, Tierra Rieta uh, with the lines running down Tierra Rieta because they already have power lines going down that road and it's a major thoroughfare. Sunset Valley Road and Reed Road are two small uh, neighborhood streets that don't uh, fit the need for huge power lines and 66 kV line. Uh, and as far as the SCE uh, statement that the 25% increase in electricity is projected, they've never been able or they've never wanted to tell us why or how they came about to the 25% uh, generation. Everybody else, the California Energy Commission says 10% at the maximum with 6% growth, and we know that Thousand Oaks is not gonna grow too much anymore because there's no more land to, to build unless we somehow acquire more land. Uh, 
The, when we compare SCE with other utility companies, we find that uh, they're way behind everybody else. There was a, an article in The Economist magazine last Friday that states that PG&E up in Northern California, believe it or not, is installing 10,000 smart meters a day and wants to equip 5 million homes by the end of 2011. Southern California hasn't even started installing smart meters. They're still in the process of studying, and it's been mandated by the government. Even the federal government is putting in a stimulus package of $3.9 billion. So we, we think that uh, Southern California should prove to us the need for the 25% increase in need of electricity. Thank you very much. Dr. Richard Elsley, followed by Kathy Brunicki, followed by Barbara Kloster. Good evening. And again, please state your name and uh, community of residence. My name is Richard Elsley, and I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks. Mayor Glancy, members of the council, it is my pleasure to be here tonight to announce the debut of the 2009-2010 season of the Discovery Center's Science Speaker Series. In the Science Speaker Series, scientists who are working in cutting-edge areas, areas that affect your daily life and mine, come and give lectures about what they're doing. But here's the best part. They give lectures that anybody can understand. Adults, teenagers, whether you have any science background or not. The first lecture is going to be in two days, Thursday night, October 15th, at Baxter Biosciences in Westlake. Starts at 7.30, so you can go to the event honoring the Teen Center, get in your car, drive over to Westlake, and catch the science lecture. First lecture is going to be on energy for the 21st century, talking about new forms of energy that we will be using in the decades to come. In November, we'll have a talk on earthquakes, why they happen, when they happen, and what we can do to be prepared. In February, we're going to take a global look, pun, in, pun intended, on what we seven billion people are doing to our beloved planet. In March, a look at the amazing things out in the universe that have been discovered by the large, world's largest telescopes, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii including that great big garbage disposal in the sky, the huge black hole that's at the center of our galaxy. And finally, in April, we will have a talk on stem cells, what promise they hold for curing diseases and what the challenges are in getting them to the point where we can do that. I've given each of you one of our flyers. You can also find out anything you ever wanted to know about the series by going to our website, which is Science Speaker Series. Dot org, science speaker series dot org. So come out and learn about all the cool stuff that scientists are discovering every day. Hey, doctor, how long are the lectures? Okay. One and a half hours, seven thirty to nine. Usually finish a little before nine. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your being here tonight. Kathy Brunicki, followed by Robert Kloster, followed by Rebecca. Buscanian, possibly. Hello. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, staff, I'm Kathy Brudnicki. I reside here in Thousand Oaks. I'm the executive director of the Ventura County Homeless and Housing Coalition. And I'm here tonight to deliver to you the latest data that we have collected. Um, you are one of the supporters of the Homeless and Housing Coalition, and so I wanted to come down here and deliver this personally and to deliver our thanks also for your support of our organization. This year, um, when we surveyed our membership about data that they were uh, looking for that didn't exist, we were asked to collect information on employment, training, and education of persons who are homeless. And we found out some really myth-busting information. In Ventura County, 15% of the homeless here are employed. Of those 15%, 47%, almost half, work full-time, and a quarter work more than one job. They're just not earning a sufficient amount to keep themselves housed. Of the 85% of the homeless population who are not employed, half 
were employed in the last year, 37% have a permanent or temporary disability, and 67% are looking for work. So I think many of us have an image in our minds of homeless people as perhaps uh, not willing to work, but this data really busts that myth. This information is available on our website to anyone who would like to take a look at it. Our website is uh, bchhc.org. And um, again, thank you for your support. We'll put it on, uh, Kathy, we'll put it on our website also, but I want to thank you for all of your efforts, everything that you've accomplished, because it's a tremendous service and it's great information for us, so thank you. Well, I do want you to know I was here with the senior group lobbying for some volunteers for our next homeless count. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Barbara Kloster, followed by Rebecca, followed by Mercedes Todes. Barbara Kloster, Thousand Oaks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mayor Clancy, City Council, and staff. I am a 36 year resident and I consider myself a survivor of many unfortunate events in my life. I had a broken neck, Legionnaire's disease, respiratory distress, lung cancer, and most recently a stroke, which occurred six months ago. <clears throat> Being able to ride my horse is a gift even though I am physically disabled and a very senior citizen. My horse serves as my lungs and my legs, and when riding him, I am just like everyone else. I started riding again five weeks ago, and my horse has performed like a service horse, walking carefully and watching everything around him without reacting to anything. In other words, he has been taking care of me. I felt it was safe for me to start riding in the equestrian park and along the neighboring streets, and I always go up and down the same streets that I traveled before my stroke. I never ride alone, and last week I found out that my usual path was not so safe anymore. Last Wednesday I was riding my horse down Brush Hill when a person who has been involved in other neighborhood incidents verbally attacked and assaulted me. She was banging and swinging a huge metal rake, screaming profanities at me and obviously trying to scare my horse. In my opinion, this was an assault with an attempt to do battery. Fortunately, my horse did not react. The horse my friend was riding negatively reacted to her actions. Neither of us were hurt, but we were upset by the incident. We made it home safely, and after catching my breath with a little help from my oxygen, which I wish I had with me now, I called a police sergeant who was aware of what had gone on with this person in the past. He said he would handle it, and I'm sure he did to the best of his ability. But I decided to go further by having the police come to my home in order to document this incident. I found the advice given to me by the officers was not to my liking as they wanted me to come home a different route than the one I always used. I know they were thinking of my safety, but in my mind it would have been giving in to a bully, which in turn gives a bully power. In my 73 years I have never given in to a bully and I'm not going to start now. It's a shame that a temporary restraining order cannot be issued in order for the police to pursue this unconscionable behavior more aggressively. As of now, I do not know if this person has been warned off or what steps will be taken to make sure this will never happen again. It is really a very sad day that something like this would occur in the neighborhood that I have lived in for 36 years. Thank you. Thanks for coming down tonight. Uh, congratulations on your recovery from the stroke. And the city manager will make a comment as to the other event. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Rebecca Boskanian, followed by Mercedes Torres, followed by Lily Wu. Good evening, and if you would uh, give me your name uh, pronounced correctly, I'd sure appreciate it. Yeah, my name's Rebecca Boskanian. You, you had it right. Um, good job. <laughs> and I'm from, Th I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks. Um, I'm here to, to talk about the presidential substation project. Um, about a year ago, well, last December, I uh, got a notice about it. And I was pregnant with this baby, and I was very concerned. And I stood here, and I talked to you guys about it. And um, I was under the impression that you were on our side. Um, and I wrote a letter recently kind of expressing my gratitude. I think a lot of you guys got that. Um, and I got a, the response I got, I kind of, um, I felt like it sounded a little bit like the propaganda that Edison um, sent us. And 
I'm just, I'm kind of concerned. Um, and I, I'm just, I just want to make sure that you guys are on our side because um, I'm, I really, I'm very against this project and um, I don't want them to build those towers in my neighborhood. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. The city manager will make a comment concerning uh, your concerns. Mercedes Torres, followed by Lily Wu. Mercedes Tedesco, uh, residents of Simi Valley. Uh, we do have a home on Reed Road in Thousand Oaks. And city council, council members, first I want to say thank you for your uh, the work you do. I realize that public service takes a tremendous commitment, and I'm very grateful that you do what you do. Uh, I'm here tonight um, because I would like to ask you to keep our concerns about the presidential substation project a priority. Um, and I understand that you do recognize the importance of undergrounding the power lines. And in today's memo uh, from Scott, um, I'm sorry, from John Prescott to Scott Mitnick, um, it does recommend uh, in a joint letter, or they're, they're talking about a joint letter from the city of Simi Valley, um, Thousand Oaks, and Moore Park to recommend to the CPUC to underground the power lines, at least in some parts. I think that is the right thing to do, and if it's the right thing to do for uh, Thousand Oaks, it's the right thing to do for the entire project, including our neighborhood on Reed Road and Sunset Valley Road. Um, so we ask that you maintain the same integrity, philosophical integrity, and carry the same urgency, work with the city of Thousand Oaks, I'm, I'm sorry, the city of Simi Valley and Moore Park, and work together to write a joint letter, submit a joint letter to the CPUC to encompass undergrounding for the entire project, including our neighborhood. Your influence does matter, and it does make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tedesco. Again, if you'll have a seat, uh, Mr. Mitnick will uh, make a comment. Lily Wu? Good evening, Mayor, City Manager, City Attorney, and Council Members. My name is Lily Wu. Uh, I live at the north border of Thousand Oaks. I also wanted to make a comment about the uh, substantial presence power line. I really wanted to make probably about personal pledge. Uh, my house, at the back of my house, about three power line right now, about 30 feet away from my house. And if they replace with the taller, about 100 feet power lines, when there is this earthquake or any other natural disasters, then my property will be under ser serious impact. As Mercedes said, uh, you guys, uh, you are working at the public services. I really appreciate these services and the work you do, and I think really, really important. Uh, for those power lines, especially so close to people's house, people's property, I think it is the right decision to make it underground or not do it right now. Those decisions will not only be three or five years impact, it will be 30 years, 50 years or longer if they put over 100 feet cement power tower. And to think about, we just brought those house not too long ago and put our life savings and have a huge mortgage. And to that particular neighborhood will be so adverse impact. And those, those house will be difficult to, to be sold. And those people living in there will be constantly consider the health impact and other bad impact to our daily life. I really begging you, put your consideration and really do the right thing, making a right decision, and your impact will not only be three or five years, 
will be 30, 40, 50 or longer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Wu. Appreciate it. Uh, there's also, that's the end of our public comment speakers. There's a statement card uh, also against the uh, presidential substation. Now, Mr. Mitnick, uh, I believe you have some comments to make. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, <coughs> uh, two subjects to uh, comment on. First off, the uh, comments about the um, uh, assault in incident. I saw that our police chief went out to talk to her, or I think he did. We will, we will make sure we follow up on, on that. Um, with respect to the comments about the proposed Southern California Edison electrical substation, and that site is on the uh, northeast portion of the community, just off of Olson Road, on the way uh, over in, uh, into the city of Simi Valley. We, just for clarification, the this, this city council has acted uh, on this matter with respect to the undergrounding of the above ground utilities. And we, we've had um, a, a number of, of communication with the California Public Utilities Commission and Edison, uh, as well as our, our surrounding cities. But I, do, I do need to stress the council has not taken a position per se on the location of the substation, but your concerns, as we heard tonight, reflect more of the undergrounding of the utilities, and we are working with that. Mark Town, our uh, city planner, is here. Several of you probably talked to him. We're going to make sure he follows up again uh, with each of you here tonight to make sure you're brought up to speed on um, our efforts. But it does help by you speaking out like this, as well as your writing letters and contacting members of the California Public Utilities Commission and the Edison Company. And, and Mark will work with you to um, explain how you can be more effective that way. I do want to share with, with and remind the residents that, that this city has been successful with the PUC on water issues and other matters. We have a, a long history and a, a good solid track record in going up to San Francisco lobbying on behalf of the residents, especially in the area of water. So we are doing what we can. We are adhering to council direction. Uh, I also need to remind the council and, and the community that um, we've had a, a, a history of recurring outages and uh, unreliable and unpredictable electricity in, in the community. Uh, several of you may remember the recurring outages and several businesses have expressed uh, significant concerns, so much so that Amgen Company several years ago contemplating having its own uh, generator on site, or, or it already has generators, but its own mini substation, if you will. So it's a serious issue. It's a balancing act to have reliable power for the community, and it's not just tied to population growth. It's tied to the advancement in technology and the use of electricity by each household and each business and so on. So we're trying to, to, to do that balancing act. On the undergrounding out there, the council's opposition is to the um, above ground lines going over the 23 freeway along Olson Road from the substation to the freeway and of course along Reed Road throughout the Terra Rojada Valley and the Sierra, uh, or excuse me, the uh, Santa Rosa Valley. So that, that's kind of an update where we are, but your, your voice is being heard and we're going to make sure it gets communicated to the PUC. Again, sorry for the long-winded answer, Mark, you'll work with these folks. That's it, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Um, we go to seven, the uh, City uh, Redevelopment Agency consent calendar. Any comments? Dr. Gillette. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Do you have a motion? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll move consent with the exception. I'd like to pull two items for discussion. Uh, item G and item I. Uh, move the rest of the consent calendar. Unless, unless there's any others. You know, let's, uh, are there any other items to be pulled? We do have one speaker on the consent, so I'll bring them down before we talk okay. about G and I. Okay, no others. Uh, Marva Benicky. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and City Council and staff. Uh, I want to thank the uh, city for coming out and observing the oak tree on Kareen Hill Court and for the... Uh, Pardon me, Ms. Benicky, would you give us your name and uh, community Oh, I'm residence? sorry. I didn't expect to speak so soon. My name is Marva Benicky, 
and my address is 629 Green Meadow Lane, and I own the property at 344 Kareen Hill Court, Thousand Oaks. And recently, uh, due to the council's persuasion that we did have somebody, that we did have the tree uh, tied into the house that was going to be built across the street at the cul-de-sac at Kareen Hill Court, we had a chance for all the neighbors to come out and meet with the city officials and they were very helpful and they considered our needs and our suggestions and it looks like everything is going to be met that we wanted. Uh, one thing that I would ask though is that the red curb along the north and the south sides of the oak tree be painted red so that there will be no mistake about parking beside either side of the oak tree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Benneke. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, Dr. Gillette. A quick question. Ms. Benneke, you, you've read the, uh, the information and the proposal, of both the pruning and the painting and everything. Is it the position of the neighbors up there uh, that this is the right thing to be done? They're, they're comfortable with this, they're satisfied with this. It goes far enough, but not too far. Is that yes, they're willing to try this at our recommendation. I think the plan before the meeting was to just get rid of tree number two. And we have very strong support. All the neighbors in the cul-de-sac came out and expressed their needs and their suggestions and they were considered by the city and uh, then we received notice that they had agreed to do a much simpler kind of pruning and they're going to try that and they'll observe the tree and then they will see if that works and if the tree needs more pruning or maybe more drastic measures down the road, so be it, but we're all going to give it a chance. That's what I wanted. Thank you very much. Thank you again. We have a speaker card uh, also from uh, Mary Wilson who's here for questions only. So if anyone has questions they'd like to pose to Ms. Wilson. Item I. Or item G. Right. None, thank you very much for putting your name on the line, Ms. Wilson. Okay, uh, Dr. Gillette, uh, G and I. Oh, okay, the other, the other one was uh, item I. And um, my question was quite simply, a little more detail on why sole source. The <clears throat> innovative interfaces is the um, um, uh, the manufacturer of our automation system for the library, which is the backbone of a library system. It's um, it's our public catalog. It's our uh, serials module. It's uh, our circulation system, and there's really only one one company that can do that uh, do that service, and that's the company we purchased it from. It, it's a single package, really. I, I suspected that was it. City uh, City Attorney satisfied with the uh, with the reasoning behind that. That's correct, and often in with computers, um, the maintenance goes along with it, so it's it's very normal. I understand it's primarily an issue of compatibility. It says so. Okay, that's fine, Mr. Mayor. In that case, uh, move consent, including uh, all of consent, G and I. Thank you. Comments to the motion? Please vote. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. We have uh, no public hearings tonight, so we will go. Um, we rescheduled 11A, Senior Adult Master Plan, uh, to precede. So, Mr. Silverberg, you're doing the presentation? No. Okay. You guys get it together and let's yeah. go. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager and Staff. I'm Martin Shentis, the Vice Chair of the Council on Aging. In May 2007, the City Council directed the Commission to develop a Senior Adult Master Plan <coughs> and Needs Assessment, referred to as SAMP. Tonight, the Council on Aging is pleased to present the highlights of the Assessment and Master Plan. The master plan was completed on schedule 
and budget and exceeded our expectations. But it's only the first step. <clears throat> the Council on Aging takes pride in the master plan and is especially indebted to the entire team who made it happen. The city staff, our agency partners, and the community volunteers on the Stamp Advisory Committee. A number of them are in the audience tonight and we would like to have them stand and be recognized. Thank you. Without the support of this outstanding dedicated team, we would not be here tonight. And now I would like to introduce the chair of the SAM committee, Commissioner Mel Silverberg. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. SAMP represents a first-of-a-kind, comprehensive municipal senior master plan within the county and state and perhaps beyond. We have initiated our planning and strategy for implementing the plan, including the formation of a new SAMP implementation committee. In doing so, we will be breaking new ground going there where there is no path and blazing a trail. By supporting this effort, the city continues to demonstrate leadership in strengthening and shaping our future senior community. The Commission's vision of accomplishing goals by the year 2020 will require a continuing commitment by the Council on Aging, the City and City Council, and broad involvement and empowerment of senior and boomer volunteers and other stakeholders. The master plan provides discovery and recommendations to the city and local agencies to assure that Thousand Oaks continues to be a healthy, senior adult friendly community and to encourage collaborative planning accomplished through outreach, partnering and advocacy. The Thousand Oaks Senior and Boomer community is a financially diverse one, which results in large differences in many basic needs. Defining needs, defining needs which result in, la in large differences in many basic needs. Defining needs representative of these demographics, as well as those with the greatest need, presented a research challenge for the project. This was met using diverse data collection methods, which included surveys, community meetings, and interviews at outreach events. We estimate as many as 5,000 individuals were reached by this process over an 18-month period. The SAMP Advisory Committee analyzed data collected and prepared summary reports used by the Commission to draft the master plan. Current estimates for Thousand Oaks indicate the senior adult population will reach 31,000 by the year 2020 or 25% of the total population estimate. The demographic results, this demographic results in a major planning challenge an age span that is larger than any other group, ranging from 50 to 100 plus, with needs ranging from negligible to significant. Here are some highlights of important findings in the plan. Based on data collected, in order of importance, housing and health care are ranked as top priorities, with transportation and recreation closely ranked at third. The current and future need for low-income affordable housing far exceeds current and projected availability. Possible housing options needed for an aging senior community range from aging in place to affordable apartments 
to skilled nursing. There is an urgent need for collaborative planning involving all stakeholders in senior housing. Healthcare costs for seniors will have a significant financial impact on city revenue, an impact which is expected to increase in the future. The city may benefit from healthcare partnerships. Preventive medicine and education will help keep our senior community healthy. This may keep health costs down, thus increasing discretionary income. Most study respondents anticipate a greater need for transportation in the future, which is consistent with an aging community. Those who utilize transportation services indicated a need for improvement with priority given to timely service. In the area of recreation and active lifestyles, most seniors indicate they currently use or have an interest in using the Goebbels Senior Center. Many boomers also showed an interest in future use of the center. Already at capacity, the Global Center lacks sufficient space for program and service increases needed for a growing senior population. Respondents from area code 91320 showed interest in a senior center or additional senior activities in Newberry Park. Studies indicate boomers may volunteer at greater rates than current seniors if it fits their background, training, and interests. A collaborative marketing campaign with agency partners is needed to encourage volunteering by stressing benefits and offering new opportunities to attract and retain seniors and boomers. Top senior priorities for task assistance were needing help with basic home repairs and yard work, a need which could be met through partnerships with youth organization volunteers. Many respondents asked the city to provide programs and services which were already available. This indicates the need for a coordinated resource for service and program information. This is a top priority. In conjunction with continuation of a robust outreach effort and marketing strategies by the Council on Aging. SAMP is a living document to be updated as needed over the next 10 years. New information and findings will lead to improved understanding, additional challenges, changes to the plan, and reordering of priorities. The Commission and its Advisory Committee will also monitor potential fiscal and economic impacts to the community arising from external sources. Such impacts could pose important challenges to planning. There are two factors vital to the effective implementation of SAMP. The first is the continued use of Advisory Committee volunteers expanded to involve more seniors as well as boomers. Using their skills and experience, these stakeholders will be empowered to make important contributions towards helping the city solve community problems. The second factor, critical and vital to effective, timely implementation, is the availability of senior staff and commissioner support to manage and monitor advisory committee effort, partnership building, and outreach. SAMP development was especially cost effective with highly leveraged use of the volunteer citizens, advisors, and advocates, and with low fiscal impact on the city, resulting in an exceptionally high value impact. This will continue during the implementation phase. A priority of our 2020 vision is to be able to reach the most vulnerable of our senior adults. 
However, a healthy, senior-friendly community must include all residents. All seniors can benefit from recreation, involvement, and preventive health care, regardless of their health status or financial standing. We must plan together as a community by reaching out, advocating, and building strong, effective partnerships. The future depends upon all of us taking responsibility for caring for ourselves and our neighbors and by sharing our experience and knowledge. There has never been a better time. We must seize this moment. Now one might ask, how can a few people make a difference in our community? Recall Margaret Mead once said, don't ever think that a small group of dedicated citizens can't change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. This plan depends on community volunteers. If you are interested in this great leadership opportunity, please call 449-2743 or email us at councilonaging at toaks.org. Although the challenges are many, the Council on Aging stands ready to move forward in pursuit of many worthy outcomes crucial to our mission. William Jennings Bryan once said, destiny is not a matter of chance, but of choice, not something to wish for, but to attain. With that, the Council on Aging requests City Council receive and adopt the Senior Adult Master Plan, and direct the Commission to organize a committee to strategically implement the plan. We want to acknowledge and thank the many individuals, agencies, and organizations listed in the report who contributed to SAMP. We thank the City Council for having the foresight and resolve to continue to support the Council on Aging's work on behalf of the senior community in the face of fiscal challenges. We would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Schilberg, um, you are to be congratulated along with all of your crew on the accomplishment of a rather tremendous task. Uh, we really appreciate the efforts that I'm, uh, you've given us a lot to, to work with and act on. Um, at this point, uh, questions, Mr. Silverberg, uh, Dr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, and thank you. <laughs> the uh, the SAMP highlights and findings, the four priorities, I believe, are going to be extremely helpful in prioritizing and categorizing the areas of focus. And my question was, does the commission have working groups in each of those areas? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Gillette. Uh, we have, as we did following on from the uh, producing SAMP, for the implementation we have six subcommittees in health, transportation, volunteering, housing, and uh, uh, task assistance and transportation. And we, have, in fact, have got those folks, uh, if you will, ready to go. They will use the action steps specifically from the plan as their guide and to set up a, their, uh, how they will look at uh, priorities and the strategies that they will use. So the answer to that is yes, we do have every, uh, six committees. Okay, that, because that will make it, uh, that will make it much easier <laughs> as we move forward for the implementation of this to focus on specific items and not deal solely in generalities. Agreed. And I was looking at one in particular, the recreation component. Because of the uh, the current downturn in the economy, uh, I know for years we have looked at the establishment of another senior recreation center in the Newberry Park area, uh, where we have a, uh, a large concentration of, of uh, seniors, residences. and. 
because this may be an opportunity for us to take advantage of the economic downturn to identify a location and start working towards the creation of such a facility and then obviously the coordinated efforts between the two so and that holds true for each I'd be particular I'll be particularly interested uh, since I represent the city on the Ventura Transportation Commission, uh, especially if your members attend the unmet needs sessions of VCTC and develop ideas and say these are the types of things that would be very beneficial to help. Uh, I know one of the areas that we're very short is uh, in general transportation region-wide. In other words, if a, a resident in Newberry Park needs to go to Simi Valley to seek certain types of medical assistance, it's, there. it's difficult, very difficult to get there. And I would share with you that uh, cities of Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks, and Moore Park have talked about transportation issues, even uh, broached the issue of a regional transportation system. A lot of that focused on making it much easier for our, our community generally and specifically seniors to get around this area, this 250 square mile service area in southeastern Ventura County to access services. So uh, thank you very much. This, I look forward to working with this. an excellent document. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Gillette. I would just add on that that here's an area where the Council on Aging here will be partnering with uh, many of our important partners like the Area Agency on Aging, which has a, a separate committee on transportation and which will be dealing with that problem because the Ventura, Ventura County Area Agency on Aging includes all members from all of the city councils, from all of the councils on aging. And so that's something we can focus with in a, in a coordinated and a, a way. Thank you. Um, Ms. Irwin, do you have a comment or question? I want to um, thank Mr. Silverberg and his entire committee again. I know how much work this is, and I also want to um, acknowledge Francine. She does such a good job with the seniors and, and the youth in the community. Um, this is uh, talking about the senior center. Actually, reading through the report, you had the suggestion to partner with the high schools, and that's really a great idea that I'd never heard of before. Maybe that's a good intermediate step in Newberry Park to look at uh, something at the, the uh, high school over there, doing some senior classes over there so um, again appreciate it great ideas and we'll support you every way we can uh, thank you uh, Councilmember Irwin uh, in the case of that particular action step that's something in the recreation subcommittee that will be specifically looked at which says how are you going to do it can you do it who do we have to talk to how do we bring it about thank you Mr. Fox uh, thanks. I was wondering uh, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the recommendation number two, which, res uh, which involves better community outreach. What, what are we not doing that you're recommending that we do? Very good question. Something that is being worked at, uh, worked on by the uh, by the Council on Aging. We do have a uh, Council on Aging uh, a committee on outreach. And we started outreach oh, almost three years ago, prior to actually coming before you and requesting, you know, uh, authorization to do the uh, the senior master plan. Uh, we went to uh, assisted living facilities, uh, street fairs. I mean, I could just name all of them, uh, and it helped. I think we've made progress. What I think is we need to sit back and review how better to market reaching these people. See, a lot, of, a lot of seniors don't really know, as I said in one of the statements, that, hey, you know, we do have this. And so we, we don't feel good when they say, gee, but, you know, aren't you aware of it? So that is something, uh, Council Member Fox, that we have to continue to emphasize on. And we have a, this, uh, that committee will specifically look at ways of improving that uh, and uh, th that is a clear important action step that we have to work on uh, how do we reach these people it's it's uh, generally uh, generally difficult but uh, I, I think uh, we can put together a strategy 
that will increase that. And in fact, let me say that if you look at our 2020 vision, uh, the goal of the commission is to be able to reach 90% of our seniors so that they'll know 90% of our seniors who will say, yeah, I know the council on any, I know where to find information, I know what, who to call and so forth. So that's our target, that's our goal. We have to work for it now, work towards that now. I was looking through your uh, the, some of the survey questions, and I don't know if it's here or not, but did you ask the question how many of the demographic that you surveyed have even been to the senior center? Yes, we did. and. Uh, uh, in one of the statements uh, in the report, we said that perhaps half or, you know, uh, many people had been there. It wasn't clear that it was more than half, but uh, about half have, are aware of or have, have you know, partaken of either a program or have gone into, uh, going to the senior center. Uh, that too is an area which requires marketing, and we will do that in conjunction with our uh, the CRPD, Canal uh, Recreation and Park District, our partner, to again see how to improve. Uh, well, transportation access. certainly is one of them, I would imagine. Pardon me? I imagine transportation certainly would be one of them. Yes, uh, transportation uh, does take those folks who don't have transportation to the center. Uh, and I know that that does occur, and in general, I think it's fairly successful. But you see, as this population ages, and people and seniors will not be allowed to drive beyond a certain point, assuming that, they're, uh, that they can get to the center, they're going to need transportation. And these, transportation, obviously, is one of those uh, areas that interfaces with being able to get to recreational activities. All right. Well, I certainly want to echo the comments of, uh, of the other council members on um, really some very, very good work. Uh, and I think it, it provides a good roadmap, not just for the seniors, but for the council and the city mm -hmm. to look at uh, uh, in terms of our goal setting and our plans on what we can do for a very, very important segment of our community. Thanks very much. Thank you. And again, thank you, all of your crew, Francine Spriegel, particularly. I know how hard she works with uh, all of you. And uh, we thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we're going to uh, re Oh, my apologies. So, Dr. Gillette, go ahead and do it. Thank you. <clears throat> move the uh, move the recommendation uh, to receive and adopt, and to direct Council on Aging to organize committee strategically implement the plan. Comments on the motion? Please vote. Motion carries four zero. Thank you. At this moment, we'll return to item seven just to clean up a little bit of housekeeping. City Clerk. Thank you. Just ordinances for second reading included ordinance adjusting and setting fees and restating rates of city water division and ordinance adjusting and setting fees and discharge limits and restating rates of the city's wastewater division. Thank you. Thank you. That doesn't need to be motion in action. City Attorney. Yeah, because um, we need a reading before um, a motion, um, if you want to adopt these ordinances, we need a new motion adopting adopting them. Okay, let's have a new motion. Ms. Irwin, would you take care of that? Yeah, I'll move to adopt. Thomas, the motion? Please vote. Motion carries. Three, Thank zero, you very much. Three, zero. That's great. We have a majority. Okay, Mr. Prescott, you have uh, item 9A. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the <clears throat> City Council. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint presentation. 
Uh, I'd also like to call your attention in the supplemental packet, we do have a, a new report or in addition to the report, transmitting some um, updated aerial photos we received from the county of the Terre Haute Greenbelt area. And then also a letter from uh, dated October 7th from SOAR uh, with some suggestions in it. Uh, the request before the City Council is um, coming from the City of Simi Valley requesting the City of Thousand Oaks and the other signatories to the Terre Haute Valley Greenbelt Agreement, and that would be the County of Ventura and the City of Moore Park, to uh, agree to an, agree uh, an amendment to that agreement to exclude the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library property and seven adjacent parcels. The Terre Haute Valley Greenbelt was established in 1983 uh, by a joint agreement of the County of Ventura and the cities of Thousand Oaks and Simi Valley. Um, its basic purpose was to preserve the uh, Terre Haute Valley as a buffer uh, in agricultural and open space uses. It was um, considered at that time uh, difficult for the different agencies, the cities, to actually provide municipal services and it had not been placed within the sphere of influence of any of the cities. Uh, after Moore Park Incorporated, uh, they joined the agreement in 1984. And it's a very simple agreement. Uh, really, the county is agreeing to retain the open space uses in the valley, and uh, the cities agree uh, not to annex any land within the Greenbelt. Uh, this is a, a photograph, aerial photograph, showing the Greenbelt boundary. It's outlined in yellow. Uh, bisected pretty much by the Route 23 freeway. To the west, it goes uh, just past the new extension of Moore Park Road. Uh, the northerly boundary is Terre Haute Road until you get uh, perhaps a quarter mile or so east of the 23 freeway, and then it includes property on the north side of uh, Terre Haute Road. On the east, the boundary is the city of Simi Valley, and on the south, pretty much the boundary is the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, I'm also shown on this land, uh, this uh, <clears throat> aerial photo, the land which is proposed to be excluded from the green belt in the southeastern corner of it. Um, just for some background on how land use is controlled in the valley right now, it's under the county jurisdiction, and uh, the county has designated the entire valley. Uh, Greenbelt area as open space within their general plan. Um, also, the properties are zoned open space with uh, varying lot sizes from 10 to 40 acre minimum. Unlike the city's open space zone, the county uh, zone does allow uh, residential use of single family residential uh, with those minimum lot sizes. Uh, it also allows certain uh, recreational and institutional uses, uh, such as the Reagan Library itself and we've listed there some of the uh, permitted uses that have occurred in the valley. Also, there are presently some unpermitted uses, uh, such as the, uh, the paintball field that's out there on Terre Haute Road. Simi Valley is asking to exclude the 228 acres, uh, which I showed on the previous map. Uh, the Green Bell itself has about 2,500 acres. Uh, within the area to be excluded, uh, there are seven eight parcels, uh, the Reagan Library. Uh, there are six 10-acre residential properties, uh, four of which are developed. They're recorded lots. And one vacant parcel of 68 acres owned by Dr. John Chu. Uh, Simi Valley already provides some urban services to those properties, including uh, water and wastewater. The only access road is Presidential Drive, which um, terminates at Madera Road in the city of Simi Valley. Uh, the council will recall that about two, two and a half years ago, we brought to you a uh, proposal by the local agency formation commission, LAFCO, to expand uh, Simi Valley's sphere of influence to include these properties. And uh, your council, as well as the council in uh, Moore Park, supported that request. The sphere of influence is a, is a plan that LAFCO is required to develop uh, for all of the uh, cities within its area, in this case the County of Ventura, as well as other uh, local agencies for the uh, ultimate boundaries for providing services. <clears throat> uh, this uh, aerial photo depicts the proposed Greenbelt boundaries. You can see that the area at the southeast corner uh, where the Reagan Library and the other properties is now uh, excluded from the proposed boundaries. 
This is a detailed aerial view of the Reagan Library and the surrounding properties. You can see the four individual homes, and then you can also see the Chew parcel uh, uh, to the right, which is a vacant and steep hillside land. Um, the process basically um, involves amending the Greenbelt to enable Simi Valley to submit their request to LAFCO. Uh, the Greenbelt Agreement itself precludes annexation by any of the parties, and LAFCO policy discourages uh, annexation of any property within the various Greenbelts in the county. And as I noted earlier, CIMI is <coughs> asking the other signatories to the agreement to uh, take the same action that's requested of City Council tonight. Um, we really did a lot of evaluation in the June 2007 staff report uh, because the uh, expansion of the sphere of influence was a precursor in our mind to eventual uh, request to change the green belt and also to annex the property. And we dealt with four issues in that report. I'll just go through them briefly. Uh, the first one is the timing of the sphere amendment. We noted that there were really four steps. Uh, the first step happened in late 2007 when LAFCO did approve the sphere of influence change. Uh, step two, before any annexation can be considered by LAFCO, they require uh, the city to pre-zone the property to indicate what zoning will apply on annexation. Uh, CME has completed that. Uh, the step three is underway now. And they intend to file the annexation to be um, considered by LAFCO at their uh, November 18th meeting. Um, one of the uh, items or issues we addressed uh, back in 2007 that's still pertinent is to preserve the integrity of the green belt. And uh, we feel that uh, even with the exclusion of this property, the uh, green belt will still have integrity. Uh, these properties are at the edge of the green belt and actually sit on uh, hillside terrain and a ridge line uh, up above the valley proper. Uh, seven of the eight are subdivided. They're already providing uh, some services from Simi Valley and they tend to relate functionally more to Simi Valley than the Terra Hata Valley. Uh, another uh, important point we felt was to maintain adequate continuing protection of the land, and that was primarily related to the 68-acre vacant parcel. The uh, other residential parcels, are, four of them are developed, and uh, there will be controls on the other two. Simi Valley, as part of its pre-zoning process, has uh, adopted zoning and a general plan designation that will require the minimum 40-acre lot size as to the 68-acre uh, the, the parcel, the Chew parcel. Uh, and also, Simi Valley, uh, unlike uh, the county, does have specific hillside performance standards that apply to areas over 20 percent slope. And that uh, particular property is uh, fairly steep slopes. So we feel that, that that would be appropriately taken care of. Um, we also wanted to make sure that uh, to the extent possible we would avoid uh, setting a precedent because the, the um, integrity of the Terra Hata Valley Greenbelt and the preservation of that as an open buffer uh, between the three cities is, uh, I think, extremely important to the city council and to the people that live in all of the cities. And so this, the uh, reasons that we've developed here uh, do distinguish the, uh, these properties from the Terra Hata Valley Greenbelt and uh, do not indicate, in our opinion, a uh, precedent or a change in the overall philosophy for the Greenbelt. Um, <clears throat> we've looked at it uh, in terms of the things that are really important to the city that we've expressed in the past that include encouraging the county to keep the valley open and agricultural. Uh, we have opposed any rezonings where uh, lot sizes less than 20 acres were proposed, not always successfully, uh, inconsistent land uses as well. And an issue that uh, was discussed uh, specifically at the meeting of the city managers and mayors on September 30th was to take an aggressive stand to support undergrounding of utilities associated with the presidential substation. Uh, some of the lines uh, for that uh, substation are proposed to cross the Terra Hata Valley or be added to uh, uh, routes that already do cross the valley. And our recommendation, we've provided a, a resolution approving the amendment to the Greenbelt Agreement, and we're uh, re recommending the city council uh, support it and adopt it this evening. Uh, I would note that there are representatives of the city of Simi Valley here uh, this evening if you have any direct questions for them.
questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Fox? In the green, it uh, references the letter from SOAR and the issue with the parcels, and it says uh, that CME was going to provide some information to the council. I was going to call on them. Okay, all right, great. Yeah. No other questions? Okay, we are, uh, I think we're honored to have with us tonight Council Member Steve Soika from Simi Valley and uh, City Manager Mike Sedell from Simi Valley. Can uh, one or both of you come down and uh, give us some information? And welcome. Thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight. Mike Sedell, City Manager, Simi Valley. Ms. Fox? There we go. Hi, Mike. Steve, thanks for taking time and coming down. The uh, Do you guys have a copy of the, of the report that's in the green? I have seen it with us, but we have seen it. Talks about the, uh, is it the CHUI parcel? Chu parcel, they call Chu it. Parcel. Dr. Chu, correct. Right. Do you guys have any comments on, on the memo? The the store memo you're talking about, which yeah, it's, yeah, the store letter. And right, we, also we received that last week. Uh, basically, they're proposing that that be left out of the annexation. Our application to LAFCO, which is in before LAFCO now for consideration, uh, does include the entire parcel as your staff described, uh, all of the parcels, uh, and we're not changing the application. Uh, the position, if asked by LAFCO, if LAFCO wanted to change, it would ultimately be up to LAFCO. If they decided that the orderly boundaries that they have prescribed in the annexation, which is what we've adhered to in our application, if LAFCO were to change those, we would not object. However, our proposal before LAFCO is to take all of those parcels that we proposed and bring them into the city as the appropriate uh, lines for jurisdictional boundaries. All right, because on the second page, it it, uh, it certainly implies that you're in concurrence with the SOAR letter, and I just wanted to get out of the record what uh, your position was. We would not object if LAFCO asks for that to not be included. However, we are not requesting it to be included. And in the discussion that I had with the SOAR representatives, we were really discussing at the time, I think, the whether or not the, the city would be opposed to leaving the Chew parcel in the green belt, which the city has no opposition to either. And that was the answer. I think they got a little transposed in, in our being amenable to, to this. Basically, our position was we would not object if LAFCO asked it to happen. All right. Very good. Thanks. Any other questions? None? Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have speakers uh, Sharon Noel followed by Ch Chuck Cron uh, Cronin. Good evening, Mayor. And City Council members, my name is Sharon Noel and I live in Moore Park. I'm here uh, with the letter as a representative from SOAR. Um, uh, I'd like to read it to you regarding the Tirahata Greenbelt annexation request from the City of Simi Valley. Dear Mayor Glancy, SOAR asks that your council consider the intent of the Tirahata Greenbelt Agreement, which calls for the preservation of open space and agricultural lands in the Tirahata Valley. The benefits of preserving these lands include establishing boundaries to stop sprawl, having cities that are distinct and separate from each other, protecting wildlife and natural habitat, and enhancing our quality of life by providing a respite from urbanization. The request by the city of Simi Valley to annex the Reagan Presidential Library and the six adjoining residential lots is justified in part by the fact that the city of Simi Valley already provides urban services to the developed properties. These services predate the implementation of SOAR and the city urban boundary restriction or curb line. However, the 68 parcel to the acre parcel to the east of the Reagan Library, which is also part of the annexation request, does not receive water or sewer services from the city of Simi Valley. The 68 acre parcel remains undeveloped open space and is part of and is consistent with the adjoining open space lands the Green Belt Agreement is intended to protect from urbanization. 
We also understand that this parcel, unlike the others being requested for annexation, would require a vote of the people to extend their urban services in accordance with the curb requirements of SOAR. While the City of Simi Valley indicates they would continue the open space zoning on the 68-acre parcel if it were to be annexed into the city, state law indicates that annexations are to be done for purposes of development. If the city has no development purposes for this land, there is no need for the city to incorporate it into its city boundaries. It is source position that this 68-acre parcel should not be annexed into the city of Simi Valley. We believe the intent of the Greenbelt annex protection is to protect open space and agricultural land in the Tierra Hada Valley from being annexed into cities and developed. We believe the Greenbelt Agreement, which calls for this parcel to remain in the unincorporated county, should outweigh the policy consideration of LAFCOs that calls for logical boundaries that are straight lines instead of meandering. While this policy has merit, it should not prevail over the more important goal of preservation of the open space land in the Green Belt. We believe the city of Simi Valley is amenable to our proposal to only annex the presidential library and the six adjoining residential lots and to keep the 68-acre open space parcel in the Tierra Hada Green Belt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions, Ms. Noel? None. Thank you very much for being down here tonight. Chuck Cronin. Mayor, thank you. This is a bit easier than following the singer. The making me follow the entertainer was very difficult. I had a five minute speech. I had to do it in three minutes. I left the last two minutes off. So I do have a sense of humor. Um, but not about this annexation, I'm sorry to say. Uh, my name's Chuck Cronin, I live in the Enclave. I'm probably one of the few people in this room that can see the Tierra Rajada Valley from his home. Okay? So I speak of it not because of power lines, but because it's a pretty important part of where we live. Uh, Lily Wu, who was here, her property actually borders it. I'm her next door neighbor. I'm a little higher. I trade the freeway noise for a view of the valley. Uh, I'm here really to say that we ask that the city not vote for this at this time. Uh, it looks like it's all teed up though. Looks pretty well prepared except someone forgot about the 68 acres or the 62 acres. And we were happy that SOAR was able to bring that up. Our community is somewhat dyslexic. We have a, we're in the city of Thousand Oaks, but the post office aligns us with the Moore Park. So we have this Moore Park. But now I find out that I should have spent as much time at the Simi Valley City Council meetings as I spend at the Thousand Oaks City Council meetings. And I'll make that point clear. I believe, and I've spoken with some of you, that until the presidential library, a presidential substation, and the related uh, transmission lines are resolved that you should not vote for the Simi Valley annexation. And I, I raise that because originally when Southern California Edison had that project uh, set up in August of 2008, it was sited in, close, in Simi Valley, had power lines in Simi Valley, and due to their protests the project was reissued as proposed in December with a hundred percent of it in Thousand Oaks, both the substation and the transmission lines, with the exception of about a mile of lines on Sunset Valley, right through Tierra Rada. So I believe that until that issue is resolved between the three cities, and I appreciate the fact that everybody is willing to send a letter to the CPUC, we all know that letter is non-binding, has no authority other than to express the wishes of the three cities, but we do believe that until that issue is resolved in the presidential substation, which has now been determined to serve only the needs of Simi Valley, is located either near or in Simi Valley, and the transmission lines that serve it are either in or around the Tierra Rada Valley and not through Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Do you have any questions? You know, I'll find out. Any questions, Mr. Cronin? None. Thank you very much for being down here. I appreciate your cutting off the last two minutes. Okay, that's the last of our public speakers.
Council discussion? Mr. Fox. Yeah, I'm going to move the City Council recommendation and a resolution to amend the Terra Rada Valley Greenbelt Agreement as requested by the City of Simi Valley to exclude 228 acres of land from the Greenbelt boundary comprising the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and seven adjacent parcels. Comments on the motion, uh, Dr. Gillette. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Having, having uh, watched this since the uh, early 60s, uh, the, tier, the whole issue of the Tierra Hada Valley and being present at the very, very first discussions about the concept of building the presidential library out there, I probably have as much background as anyone in the community on how this has taken place. And the, the, I'm going to support the motion, and one of the reasons I'm going to support it is, from my perspective, I'm most concerned what action provides the most protection from out of control or any type of additional urbanization in the Tierra Hada Valley. And when I take a look, I mentioned it before, and I don't want to belabor this, but when I take a look at that driving range that illuminates that valley like a calliope at night, that never should have happened. It's a travesty to the concept of open space, and I thoroughly believe that a municipality, a city, city of Simi Valley, is in a better position to protect that property than any of the uh, any of the former stewards of it. And for those reasons, I'll uh, I'll support the motion. Thank you, Ms. Irwin. Uh, Mr. Gillette basically said with what I was going to. I, I appreciate Mr. Cronin coming and speaking also. I, I do think that these issues aren't linked and we can't hold up um, uh, uh, Simi Valley's request. But I do. it's absolutely essential that we maintain the green belt. And the, as Mr. Gillette said, the county has done a um, poor job of that with the driving range and the paintball uh, and the nursery that's there and I think that with the stricter hillside standards that Simi has and uh, just basically stricter overall standards that they're in a better position to protect that the last uh, parcel so I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Make of the motion? No, I think both Mr. Gillette and Ms. Irwin um, capsulize the, the key points to this issue and, and uh, I, I do think it needs to be pointed out. Uh, I, I find it interesting that uh, some of the open space advocates would uh, want to take a different approach, uh, recognizing uh, what is undeniably totally inappropriate development in the Tararana area. Completely inappropriate. Would never be approved uh, had that area be in either the city of Thousand Oaks or the city of Simi Valley. And so clearly this is the uh, attempt not only to rightfully put the, the presidential library uh, within the city of Simi Valley, uh, but also to do a good job, a better job of protecting that green belt and that open space. That's all I have. Thank you for those comments. Uh, please vote. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. We're looking at uh, 9B, report on the uh, community mediation program, six month review. Gentlemen, Mr. Sergeant Aguilar and Chief Madsen. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. On April 21st of this year, City Council approved the implementation of the Community Mediation Program to make dispute resolution available to benefit the community. Council directed the Police Department to return in six months to report on the progress of this program. The Community Mediation Program has generated consistent activity over the past six months. Cases referred to the mediation program have mostly involved property line disputes, landscaping issues, 
and long-term loud music complaints. The majority of cases referred for screening through the COPS unit to the program coordinator have enabled the program to remain focused. The community mediation program has also received referrals from citizens who learned of the program through the media releases during the program's announcements. There have been a total of 21 cases that have been screened and open for mediation. Of the 21 cases, eight have been resolved either by agreements or participants during the screening process or attending a mediation session. There were three cases in which either party declined to mediate. In September, there have been 10 new cases opened. A total of 13 referrals have been initiated through the police department. Five referrals have been initiated by citizens, and there has been one referral each initiated by the city manager's office, the city attorney's office, and code enforcement. The community mediation program has progressed at a successful pace in the first six months. The program is capable of moving forward at the same level of service for the next six-month period. Council will, be, uh, council will be presented a one-year review of the program at that time. Uh, we are recommending uh, acceptance of this report, and tonight I have Sergeant Don Aguilar of the Community Oriented Policing and Problem Solving uh, Unit here, as well as Senior Deputy Ed Tumbleson, our community officer, to assist in uh, answering questions, and we're available for questions. Thank you, Chief. Questions? Ms. Irwin. That sure looks like this program is starting out in the right direction. I had one question. How many volunteers have you trained? We don't know how to use the equipment. <laughs> uh, we haven't had any actual training. Uh, the volunteers we have have been through trainings uh, through the uh, ongoing programs in Ventura oh. or, or Camarillo. And so was it Ms. Uh, Nofke that did all the initial cases, or was it the other the volunteers that you have? Ms. Nofke uh, is the primary mediator, and the other mediators join her uh, at the sessions. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Gillette. Thank you. Gentlemen, I don't know who this is to. I, Ms. Uh, uh, Sergeant Nagler, I hope you're feeling better. I, I understand you've been a bit under the weather. Much better, thank you. All right, fine. Uh, have, has this program, have you had any opportunity to utilize this program or these concepts in the Waverly Heights area of the city? Not so far. Had we had this program started at that time, uh, there's a good chance that we could have uh, initiated the program and, and come to a, a different uh, uh, position than we have at this point. Okay, because that, that stands out to me as a, a situation that has, uh, has polarized a neighborhood. Uh, very, very strong, passionate feelings by a large number of residents and, and something like this uh, objective third party mediation and introduction at, at an early point probably could have, I'd like to think that it would have helped. So We, we believe absolutely uh, that would be the case and uh, we really encourage uh, both parties want to get involved in the mediation and that's the starting point for us and once that happens uh, then we have the thumbs up and uh, we get both parties going and we really do get a lot accomplished that way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Further questions? Then, Yeah, Dr. Gillette, go back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, move to receive and file. Comments to the motion? You know, I will make one comment. I think that uh, Sergeant Aguilar um, mentioned something that, that really is a necessary ingredient of this whole equation, and that is both parties need to uh, want to ne negotiate. And uh, in absence of that, I think we have a stalemate and no progress. Uh, Mr. Please, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. Actually, I was just thinking, problems. yeah, one question. Uh, and I mentioned this at the last meeting. Have we done any outreach with uh, Pepperdine University Strauss Institute? I have talked to one of the uh, doctors out there about the mediation and bringing training to the city of Thousand Oaks. Okay, yeah, they. Uh, I got my master's from there in in dispute resolution. They're uh, the uh, the people that head the Strauss Institute are very aware that that I'm on the city council here, and and uh, I think they would be uh, very interested in in at a minimum pro uh, providing uh, interns that are getting their graduate uh, degree. Many of them are also law students. 
Uh, they have to do a certain amount of volunteer hours in mediation. Seems like a natural. Uh, and then for ongoing training, I know that they have offered uh, pro bono many times to provide uh, training in mediation. And uh, this is this program is exactly what uh, Pepperdine uh, uh, encourages. And, and so. Uh, if we have not done some outreach and let them know that Thousand Oaks has started a public mediation program, I think you're going to find that uh, that Peter Robinson, Dr. Peter Robinson in particular, will be very, very interested in, in assisting whatever in whatever way uh, we ask them to. I, I would just comment that we're looking in that direction. Um, after the first year is over, we're on a short leash to see right. how well we manage this program. Right now, we're managing it very well. If at the end of the year it's council's wish to move forward, we're definitely going to uh, go back to uh, the professor there at Irvine and look for uh, interns and training and and uh, to expand the program. Right. Very good. Thanks. Dr. Gillette, in light of the, uh, the comments, would you like to have any follow-up comments on your motion? None? Okay, please vote. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to uh, 9C, Second Amendment to Implementation Agreement, fiscal year 2008 9, uh, Stormwater Quality Management Program. Uh, Mr. Watkins? Thank you, Mayor Gillette, members of the City Council. Yeah, the, uh, we have to wait a little bit for uh, Mayor Gillette to be Mayor Gillette. I said Mayor Glancy. Did I? Can I? It's too late. <laughs> and I'm glad my city manager wasn't here for that one. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Glancy, members of city council. Uh, next item before you is consideration of the second amendment to the implementation agreement between uh, City of Thousand Oaks and the Ventura County Watershed Protection District. Uh, just a reminder, we've got an MPDES permit that we share with the other 10 cities in the county. The basic elements of that permit are uh, public outreach, construction, land development, and then monitoring and inspection. Uh, the program really has, has evolved from an educational program where a lot of the early, early years of the program were about to just educating the public that uh, storm drains lead straight to our creeks and rivers and straight into the ocean. A lot of that outreach has been geared to children. There's uh, various outreach materials we put together. On the construction side of things, again, uh, trying to prevent any of the stormwater pollution that comes from construction sites, a lot of effort in those areas, a lot of sandbagging, um, rumble strips, other things that have become very familiar on construction sites over the years. On the solid waste side, it's not hard to see that with lack of uh, proper housekeeping, you could, uh, with a rain event, transport a lot of pollutants in a big hurry. And then a lot of the permanent uh, best management practices we're seeing in land development, including retaining the water on site. Uh, here's a picture of the Grant Brimhall Library showing where the stormwater is flowing through some grassy swales, areas where you can both collect trash and, uh, and, and clean the water up before it goes into the storm drainage and other developments similar. The uh, next picture is kind of the inside of its catch basin, which you don't get to see often, but showing uh, trash excluders, and then the outside view showing how that would keep any of the trash and debris out of the catch basins, allow us to pick it up with a street sweeper. And then some of the other permanent is uh, porous pavement, some of the uh, grassy uh, parking areas so that you don't have as much runoff. Uh, these are the types of things that are becoming more and more familiar. And so, uh, with all of that, uh, we've got the implementation agreement between us and all the cities in the county, and we're all pursuing these things jointly. To implement these programs, uh, they're, they're, the agreement does assign the roles and responsibilities. It also designates a principal permittee, and it designates all the cities as the co-permittees. And the Ventura County Watershed Protection District is the principal permittee. Uh, when this permit was first issued and we first en entered into the agreement, there was a benefit assessment that was put together to fund the program. Unfortunately, with the passage of Prop 218, those benefit assessment amounts were frozen back in 1996, which leads to issues these days with both this city and every other city as how it's going to be funded. What happened to the district over time is that they initially had a portion of their funding for principal costs and a portion of their funding for co permittee costs, since they have the similar obligations as the rest of us. And over time, they were forced to use all of their funding for principal permittee activities. And since all the cities benefit from that, a committee of public works directors was put together to determine a fair and reasonable way to share those costs, since all the cities do benefit from those costs and their obligations of all of us. 
And that resulted in the, the formula that currently exists where the district dedicates half of their revenues and then as a co-permittee they pay 15% uh, of the rest that's left over. And that was the agreement that was entered into by all 10 cities in 2007 and 2008. And at this point, we're the only city that hasn't entered into the second amendment uh, for 2008-2009. And the reason that amendment was needed is because we were waiting for a new stormwater permit. And so the existing permit lasted into this year. We do have a new permit that was finally issued to us in May and became effective in August. Now with this new permit, uh, we'll need a new implementation agreement. And we're working on that, and a group of city managers is getting together trying to determine funding because the cost for all of us are continuing to go up and looking at different funding options. Uh, but nonetheless, at this point, the city uh, needs to carry its fair share of the principal permittee activities, and so the action before you tonight is to uh, approve the second amendment, which will take us up through just this last uh, June, so it takes us through June 30th, 2009. The net effect on us is around $100,000. We get about 300000 in revenue. This will uh, shift about 1000 of that to the Watershed Protection District for principal permittee activities. Uh, this is the same agreement that the City Council approved in 2007 and 2008. Uh, so with that, we recommend approval of the Second Amendment to the implementation agreement, and we're more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Deputy Director. I appreciate that. Um, questions, Dr. Gillette? Uh, Mark, as I looked at this and, and reviewed it and I've listened to comments on this, a question came to mind, and uh, you're probably in the best position to answer this. The uh, Watershed Protection District is a countywide district, correct? Yes. And it's governed by the Ventura County Board of Supervisors? Yes, they, they sit as the district board. As the district right. board. Has there been any type, is there ever any type of analysis to take a look at funding sources for the count, county watershed protection district to ensure that all of the areas that receive this service are equally supporting it versus areas with higher uh, assessed valuation paying a disproportionate share to the county to support other areas that don't have a tax base or a adequate tax base? It, some different options have been looked at in the past. Um, none of them are easy. The way it's currently done is based on benefit assessment units. And so that's actually a number of parcels. And from that perspective, we actually have more benefit assessment units than any other city in the county. So we have more than Oxnard, for example. What they have is more density. So even though their population is significantly greater than ours, the number of parcels they have is less. And so because of that, we are the highest. So we've looked and tried to determine another way to do it. It could be done a combination of population-based, land use. Um, it needs to be some way that reflects the actual impact on stormwater quality. Um, but, and so there's been some effort to try to come up with a way. There hasn't been a better way that's, that's been achieved yet. Uh, Mr. Mitnick and I had the opportunity to address this to the city manager's group last month and, and put out that, um, that question, and, and there was some interest in, in doing that and, and trying to find a way that is more equitable that hasn't been achieved yet. Okay, well, I appreciate that because in these, uh, in these uh, very difficult fiscal times, um, given the fact that the uh, the district does not have an independent objective management system in place and a public agency which actually uses the services in the management position, I'm always concerned about uh, fairness and equity of, uh, of uh, resources going in versus services being put out. And as long as uh, you and the city manager are sensitive to that and aware of it, and we can we can monitor it, uh, that that's fine with me. But it's something that uh, I'm always concerned about, uh, especially in view of what we're dealing with with the fire protection district. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. You have a comment, um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, to follow up on Mayor Pro Tem Gillette's comments. Um, uh, Public Works Director Mark Watkins is correct. We have been working with our, our colleagues at both the Public Works Director level and the City Manager's level, and the discussion will continue again this Thursday at our monthly meeting. We are looking at the possibility, and you'll recall in the, um, the uh, internal auditor's proposed work plan for the next year, one of the uh, items listed there 
is to do a review of the management structure and the methodology, the management structure of uh, county flood protection and the methodology used to calculate our charge. So we are taking a look at it that way. We're also contemplating the uh, potential use of an outside consultant to, to do a review. So this just gets us through last year, 08, 09. The next year, 9, 10, becomes a challenge. I'm going to work with our, our colleagues to get a more uh, equitable and fair uh, methodology. All the cities are experiencing this hit, and it's hitting their general funds. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with the new countywide permit. Um, so there it is. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Watkins or Mr. Mitnick, uh, would you explain to me why the county withheld $210,000? Yeah, out of our current assessment this year, we've, we've been receiving around $300,000 annually for our uh, benefit assessment for stormwater quality. In 2007, 2008, we entered into the First Amendment, which transferred about $100,000 of that to the district. So the net to us was about $200,000. For this year, oh, I'm sorry, for 08, 09, the year that ended this June, we did not end, enter into that, the Second Amendment. All the other cities did. The district took the position that under the original implementation agreement, there were shared costs that were mentioned in that agreement. And so they did an analysis and said, well, if we assign you shared costs, then your share would be on the order of $200,000. And so when they did their disbursements this year, we get that these funds come to us once a year in August, we received a check for around $90,000, and they had withheld $210,000 for these shared costs. With the city's council actions tonight, we would get an additional 100000 because this amendment, which is consistent with all the other cities, would assign our share at around 100000 rather than that 210. Um, we don't agree that the county's assessment on that was right, that that 210000 was accurate. We don't think they should have withheld that, that money. Uh, we haven't had to engage in that fight because uh, we're recommending that, that we approve the amendment here tonight, which would be consistent with all the other cities and with what we did last year. And then we'll be looking going forward very, very closely at how these costs are, are divided amongst us all. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay. Um, comments, will of the council? Dr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the uh, staff recommendation to accept the self-assessment efforts public works towards uh, full accredited. Oh, whoop, 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 wrong one. Wrong one. Let's see. Approve the Second Amendment of the 1992 Implementation Agreement with Ventura County uh, Watershed Protection District for 08-09. Thank you. Comments to the motion? None. Please vote. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Watkins, why don't you go right into uh, 11-D. Thank you, Mayor Delancey and members of the City Council. Uh, next item is Public Works Department accreditation. The American Public Works Association is, is the largest national professional organization within the public works field. And a number of years back, they developed an accreditation program to help public works departments both meet certain standards within our field as well as document their efforts and then undergo a third-party review. The objectives of the accreditation are to increase the professionalism within our industry, to help for succession planning through documenting of all our work processes, and to instill pride and recognition for the work that we do. Additional benefits that we've discovered going through this process have included uh, streamlining of some efforts. It's helped us with the documentation and our succession planning as we've had a number of supervisors and superintendents retire and we've got well-documented work processes. It's also helped in streamlining and um, putting a lot of these items uh, into a computer database that can be easily accessed by everyone. Uh, the self-assessment process is nearing completion. One of the steps that we have to take is to have the City Council recognize that our self-assessment is complete. We've done the systematic review of almost 500 different uh, practice areas and documented what we do. This has been consolidated into a web-based manual, and we will be the first in the nation to do a web-based accreditation program. In the past, it's always been written policies that, in essence, ended up in one big binder, and that's what would be reviewed in, in addition to a field review. Ours are linked to the existing city's policies, the uh, city's e-manual, and others, 
and our accreditation um, reviewers when they come will be doing it all online. We found that we are in full or substantial compliance with all of these different areas and that we are ready to take the next step, which will include a, a peer review of our self-assessment and then a site visit by professionals from other agencies. And with that, they would then make a recommendation as to our degree of compliance, uh, whether we likely have to um, make a few changes and, and to come into full compliance, and, and after that we would be accredited by the American Public Works Association. And so with that, we're asking that the City Council accept the self-assessment efforts that we have done. Uh, these were all up in the Council's reading file for Council's review and allow us to proceed with full accreditation by the American Public Works Association. Thank you. Questions? Dr. Gillette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the uh, recommendation to accept the self-assessment. I'm sorry, do you have cards? Do you have anything? Okay. We have nothing. To, to, uh, Excel, accept the self-assessment efforts Public Works Department towards full accreditation by the American Public Works Association. Also, uh, Mr. Watts, to you and your staff, congratulations on your accomplishments, and we look forward to it being completed. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Comments to the motion? Other than uh, echo the uh, congratulations. Thank you. Please vote. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, redevelopment agency reports. We have none. Committee Commission uh, board reports. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Council uh, issues recommendations, follow-up reports of meetings and conferences. Um, I did on September 23rd and 24th attend the uh, National uh, or the Information Technology and Communication Steering Committee meeting in Washington, D.C. The thrust of that uh, of that committee has been the dissemination of uh, wideband or broadband. I'm sorry, and um, that's really what uh, we spend an awful lot of time doing is trying to figure out what has to be done uh, beforehand in preparation for. Um, this time we had uh, some information that the Recovery Act had provided $7.2 billion to the National Telecommunications Information Agency for dissemination and uh, $4.7 billion to, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, $2.5 billion to Russ, the uh, rural services, again for dissemination. So that's really the thrust of, of what we've been working with, that and, and hearing the, of the goings-on of uh, the FCC. Uh, we did uh, review and discuss an, a new resolution for 2010, which is calling on the federal government to maximize its stimulus support for broadband Internet uh, adoption, supporting broadband deployment, adoption, and usage in underserved areas. But uh, with that, I recommend that... We received the report. Please vote. Actually, that doesn't require a vote. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Um, city Manager, follow up requests, et cetera. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, just to reiterate by way of follow up, we heard a lot of comments about the undergrounding of electric, uh, electric utilities uh, out in the Terra Rajada uh, Valley and, and surrounding areas. We are working with our the other two cities, Simi Valley and Moore Park, and the joint letter with the three mayors should be coming uh, soon. Well, at least that, that that's the hope and expectation. Mark Town, our city planner, will be in contact and, and coordinate with those folks who spoke here tonight. So we will follow up with them. Okay, um, announcements and upcoming stuff. I should remind the council and the public that last week on October 7th was the city's 45th birthday. Um, uh, that was uh, quite, a, quite an achievement. We are now 445. Coming up on October 22nd, California Lutheran University will be celebrating its 50th birthday with an anniversary dinner. And I, Drew, I think we can put a link to CLU at our, on our website or do something to help get the word out. And for those who are interested in attending that event or, or other events with our local university, please feel free to contact the university or, or check our website and we'll, we'll help provide a link. Uh, the next city council meeting will be on October 27th. At this point, there are three public hearings that we are aware of. The first involves a private residence um, at 5433 North Lakeview Canyon Road, appealing a planning, commis uh, planning commission decision to deny uh, a, a use on that property, and that comes to the council on the 27th. 
the alcoholic energy drinks ordinance that comes to city council. We're, we're excited about that. We're one of the first to do that in not just our, the county but the state. Our police department will be presenting that to you. And also we have a code amendment dealing with tree pruning uh, guidelines and that'll come to you. Uh, that's it for city manager update. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. Mr. Norman, you have a closed session to announce? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. And council now convene a closed session um, for three separate items. The first is a conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9C. Also conference with real property negotiators. The agency negotiators will be Mark Watkins, myself, and Mike Tahidian. Under negotiation will be the price and terms of 28 properties pursuant to government code section 54956.8. The properties and owners are 580 Herbs Road. The owner is Reyes Avalis, 474 Herbs Road, Jonathan and Jerry Baker, 540 Herbs Road, Lee and Lona Betts Trust, 446 Herbs Road, Tom and Lori Bull, 420 Herbs Road, Abdal Gassemi, 778 Herbs Road, Mark and Kim Lindemann, 530 Herbs Road, Philip Maurice, 632 Herbs Road, Janine McBride, 645 Herbs Road, John and Thomasine Mitchell, 502 Herbs Road, Philip Olney, 467 Herbs Road, Russell and Loretta Baviat Trust, 445 Herbs Road, Gregory and Lisa Robinson, 735 Herbs Road, Richard and Hendarina Wiley, 265 Herbs Road, 269 Herbs Road, 321 Herbs Road, 329 Herbs Road, 335 Herbs Road, and APN number 670-0-210-270, all owned by Ascension Evangelical. 150 Herbs Road, owned by Mariko Masukawa. 300 Herbs Road and 304 Herbs Road owned by the Conejo Recreation and Park District. APN number 670-0-350-120 and 93 Herbs Road, Monterey Woods HOA, 271 Herbs Road, Tamara Hilo, 214 Herbs Road, Richard and Lisa Thorns and Trust, 67 Herbs Road, Robert and Pearl Fletcher Trust, 256 Herbs Road, the Lie Trust. Also confidence with real property negotiators for property located at 1948 East Thousand Oaks Boulevard, 1938 East Thousand Oaks Boulevard, 1900 East Thousand Oaks Boulevard, 265 Oakwood Drive, 182 through 210 Thousand Oaks. I'm sorry. The agency's negotiators will be Scott Mitnick, um, Candace Hong and Amy Albano. I'll be substituting for Ms. Albano. Um, negotiating parties will be Bob Majorino and Francis Prince and negotiating the price and terms pursuant to government code section 54956.8. There is no reportable action from these closed sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Uh, with that, then, we will adjourn to our regular scheduled meeting for October 27th, 2009.